93.7 FM. Online. GoBrave.org. A tune-in radio station. Part of the William Patterson Broadcast Network. Broadcasting live from Hobart Hall in Wayne, New Jersey. This is The Innovative. I think they're really unique. The Fearless. They have awesome variety. The Kick-Ass. I love Brave New Radio. The Sensational. I've never heard anything like it. This is the one and only Brave New Radio. The views and opinions expressed on this show are solely those of the host and guest and are not necessarily supported by WPSC 88.7 FM, station management, or the station owner, William Patterson University. Anyone wanting to offer differing opinions may do so by calling the show at 973-720-2738. Abusive callers will be rejected. Now here's your program on WP 88.7 FM Brave New Radio. Well, good morning, good morning. Good morning to you, and it is a wonderful morning indeed. The fact that we are still breathing and still alive and can hear and see and do all those things that we were put on the earth to do makes it a good morning indeed. If you can hear the sound of my voice, once again, it is indeed a wonderful morning. And if you don't know who you're listening to, it is none other than Mark Medley. We come to you live each Saturday morning from 6 o'clock a.m. to 7 o'clock a.m. with the Reading Circle with Mark Medley, where we bring you the best of what's going on in the literary world. So I ask you to sit back and relax. You know, if you've been listening for any amount of time, our ritual and routine, which I'm going to share the weather with you, then I'm going to read from two different books, an inspirational message from each one. I'm going to introduce our guest who's already on the line and then share what we call some information with you, a public service announcement. And then we come back. We will resume with our interview. So I need you to get on all your social media sites and let someone know that the reading circle is indeed on the air. That's what I was doing prior to me wishing you a good morning. I was on my Hootsuite site letting everyone know that we are indeed up and running and on the air this morning. So without further delay, let me let you know what's going on with the weather here in the Wayne, New Jersey area. Right now, 64 point one degrees and we're expecting to move up to a high of 74 we're going to have scattered showers and thunderstorms a few storms may even be severe as i said a high of 74 low of 65 some more scattered thunderstorms early tonight 60 percent chance of rain this evening 50 percent chance of rain during the day so Mm, it looks like we're going to get a little bit of rain today here in the New Jersey area. Then tomorrow, Sunday, from what I understand, is the best of the last few days. We're going to have 83 as a high, 62 as a low. And we're going to have some sun in the morning with increasing clouds during the afternoon, possibly a stray shower. There's only 20% chance of raining on Sunday night, partly cloudy skies, low of around 60. Then on Monday, sunshine and clouds, mixed high of 83, low of 61. Tuesday, intervals and clouds and sunshine, high of 88, low of 65. And then on Tuesday night, actually, it's going to clear up. On Wednesday, mostly sunny skies, high near 90. And then 69 as a low as we round out the forecast brought to you right here from the WP 88.7 FM Weather Center. As I said, if you're a long time listener, you know the routine. If you're first time listener, welcome. I read from two different books by two different authors to kick the show off in an inspirational mode. No other motive than that. Not proselytizing, not preaching, not converting, not doing any of that. It just happens so that the books have positive messages, even though they may reference things that things folks may think. Not, no, it's not about that. But truly today for the July 9th, out of the book, The Power of Being Thankful, 365 Devotions for Discovering the Strength of Gratitude. And that's by Joyce Meyer. For July 9th, she says, prayer doesn't have to be long. Call to me and I will answer you and tell 
value great and unsearchable things you do not know. The length of our prayers really makes no difference to God. All that matters is that we pray the way he is teaching us to pray and that our prayers are spirit led, heartfelt, thankful and accompanied by faith. Throughout the Bible, there are incredibly brief but powerful prayers. Here are a few of them. Moses prayed for his sister. Heal her now, O God, I beseech you. Elijah prayed, O Lord, my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. There will be times when you'll pray longer prayers than others, but there is no correlation between how many minutes or hours we pray and whether God hears us. Just one word spoken to him in faith from a sincere heart can reach his heart and move his hand. Our prayer of thanks. Thank you, Father, that I can give or that I can pray to you from my heart, no matter how long or short that prayer may be. I am grateful that I can just be myself when I'm with you. On that note, I'm going to deviate just a tiny bit since we were talking about short prayers or prayers. Be sure you pray for those families of those two young men that we lost a couple days ago. And by all means, pray for Dallas, for those five plus officers that we lost down there. I'm going to talk more about that in the next hour. But a human being is a human being. A person is a person. A life is a life. Doesn't matter if they wear the uniform. Doesn't matter what color they are. Doesn't matter what gender they are. What sexual preference they have. A person is a person is a person is a person. And it's their lives. So by all means, pray for all of these folks who have lost lives to this foolishness that we are see going on, not only here in the country, but around the world. Now, I broke from my normal ritual routine to take a pause for that. I'm going to talk more about it in the next hour. But from Ian Van Zant's book, Until Today for July the 9th, she says, I will gain more understanding when I realize spiritual malnutrition is a condition that can be cured. What if you were forced to sustain yourself on a low-calorie, minimal intake diet for the rest of your life? Or worse, what if you were told that you could never eat again? No more chocolate, no more homemade soup. How would you feel? How would you survive? If you did not eat to sustain your physical body, you would eventually grow weak and weary. As you used up the reserve resources of nutrients and vitamins, your vital organs would stop functioning. Your body would begin to shrivel up and waste away. A person can only diet or fast for so long before the body demands to be fed. The same is true of the spirit. Some people are suffering from spiritual malnutrition. Some people have deprived themselves of spiritual nourishment for so long they no longer have the strength to handle the weight of their lives. Their vision is shot. Their sense of self has been diminished to the point that it is a chore for them to do the simplest task in their lives. Spiritual malnourished people are fretful and frightened, worried and worrisome. They are drained and draining. They have their eye on someone else's plate, someone else's life, and they will stretch their shriveled and shaking hand out for whatever crumbs can be spared. There's only one cure for spiritual malnutrition. It is a steady diet of spiritual food. Prayer builds the spiritual structure. Faith put meat on the spiritual bones. Gratitude builds spiritual muscles. If you are feeling worn out, run down, or weary, check your spiritual diet. You may need to increase your intake of spiritual nutrients. Until today, you may have been suffering from spiritual malnutrition. Just for today, increase your intake of spiritual food. Engage in a few spiritual experiences. Test your spiritual muscles. Make the necessary adjustments to your spiritual diet. Today I'm devoted to increasing my spiritual intake. And that's from the book Until Today by Ian Levan Zant. All right. I am going to introduce my guest. She's already on the line. I always say waiting in the wings. I guess that's a TV term, but she is waiting on the line, waiting in the wings. She called in right on time. I always have my guest to call in at 5.55 a.m. Eastern Time, and she has done just that. And that is none other than Dr. Karen Anderson Abrell. And she holds a master's degree in clinical psychology and a doctorate in developmental psychology. She spent the early portion of her career as a psychotherapist for children in Chicago's child welfare system and then stepped into academia for 10 years. As a professor, she delivered a number of well-received presentations at national and international psychological or psychology conferences covering issues such as 
identity development, and family dynamics. Despite these credentials, she's no stuffy academic peering down from the ivory tower. In fact, the inspiration for her writing derives from the ebb and flow of her personal relationships, in addition to data garnered from professional research. Yet, it's precisely this fusion of academic chops and, quote, a girl about town, unquote, experience that perfectly positions her to tackle themes of relationships and single adulthood. Readers perceive her as one of them, quote unquote, connecting with her accessible and engaging voice. Yet as an academic, she provides a measure of objectivity and authority that enlightens, encourages, and empowers. Dr. Karen first became interested in writing about dating and relationships when examining the complex emotions involved in her own engagement. As she questioned her motivations for marriage, she feared she loved her fiancé but wasn't in love. There is a difference. After months of internal conflict, she realized that although he was a great guy, marrying him would feel like settling. So she called off her wedding two months before it was to occur. Back out there, quote unquote, in the dating scene, she became keenly aware of the messages directed toward single women. Messages that appeared disparaging and illogical, yet hailed from reliable sources such as the local bookstore's self-help section. <laughs> Drawing on the data of other academic researchers and first-hand accounts of the many women she interviewed personally, Dr. Karen wrote, Single is the new black. Don't wear white till it's right. In an effort to provide a logical counter message of encouragement. Practicing what she preaches, Karen waited for the right guy and didn't meet him until age 40. Two years later, they were married and it finally happened for her. A compelling presenter, Dr. Karen speaks to groups on dating and relationships, identity development and authenticity, emotional wellness, and adult family relationships. All right. With all that being said, Dr. Karen, good morning. Hey, good morning to you, Mark. Oh, thank you so much for rising with me. Uh, Dr. Karen is calling from Indiana. I believe you're on Central Time. Am I correct? You got it. <laughs> all right, she's on Central Time. So it's 612 here East Time. It's 512 Central Time. And I always make a big deal of that because I have guests that call in from California. So when it's 6 o'clock a.m. our time, it's 3 o'clock a.m. their time. So I'm always very appreciative of all my guests. But from those who call in even earlier than what I think I rise, I'm really appreciative. <laughs> <laughs> so I tell you what, as, as I shared with you before we went down, I'm going to share some information with the listening audience. We call that a public service announcement. Public service announcements, we share some information with you, listening audience, you know what to do. Get on all, and I do mean every last one of your social media sites. Wake up somebody, text somebody, tweet somebody, you do what you need to do to let someone know that Dr. Karen is on the air with me. And this is a subject I think everybody, for the most part, in one way or another, ought to be able to relate to. And that is relationships. So, let somebody know that Dr. Karen is on the air while I'm sharing this information with you, and we will resume our interview in a couple of minutes. This year, firefighters like Fire Chief James Hall will battle wildfires around the country in hopes of containing them. But firefighters can't do it alone. A single ember that escapes from a wildfire can travel more than a mile, or it can ignite and destroy your home and community. Get Fire Adapted. Learn simple steps you can take now to reduce wildfire damage later at fireadapted.org. A public service message brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service and the Ad Council. Learn more at fireadapted.org. 50 feet, turn left. Why are you driving so slowly? After a few drinks, I'm taking it slow. Well, you're not fooling the cop behind you. What? Get ready to pay in point one miles. <sighs> Getting pulled over for buzz driving could cost you around $10,000 in fines, legal fees, and increased insurance rates. Nothing kills a buzz like getting pulled over for buzz driving, because buzz driving is drunk driving. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. You're listening to The Reading Circle with Mark Medley on Brave New Radio. Yes, indeed, you are. You are listening to The Reading Circle with Mark Medley. And my guest this morning is Dr. Karen Anderson Abrell. Dr. Karen, am I saying your last name right? Is it Abrell or Abrell? How, how do you say it? Is it Abrell? 
you know, it's April. So like April, the month. Ah, April. There we go. See, that's why I always ask, because I have a pet peeve with messing up people's names, and I don't like anyone to mess up mine. So that's no. why I always ask. So it's April. Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Here we go. Let's go back to like kind of how did you decide you wanted to go into this field? Is this something like as a little girl when they ask, what do you want to be when you grow up? You said a psychologist or how did you get there? What was your road to this path? Yeah. I mean, I think that's such an interesting question because when we come back and you know take a view back from where we came from and I mean, I was little and I knew I wanted to talk to people about their problems and it's so funny because I'm I didn't know anyone who'd gone to therapy I mean especially in the 70s that wasn't quite as um as a prevalent thing as it is now and you know so I had no frame of reference for it but I knew I wanted to talk to people about their problems and so that turned into the clinical degree which is so for a while I was a therapist as you mentioned in my bio and then from there going into academia which actually does make a little more sense. My father was a professor of music, actually, at the University of Cincinnati, and my mother was a teacher, so that made more sense. Oh, all right. Well, I, I'm an educator as well, and so and my wife is as well, and I have a daughter that is, so I'm from an education family as well, so I can relate in terms of that, and, and, and you said your father was a music professor? Yeah, he was at oh. uh, the College Conservatory of Music in Cincinnati. All right, well, there's, there's a lot of ties or connections or commonalities in it because I'm a musician as well. So I can. Are you? Yes, as a matter of fact, the music playing in the background is my original CD. I, I did two CDs. Really? Yes, and I used it for the show. <laughs> well, yeah, you sure should. I have some of my music on uh, on my website as well. Yeah, that, it's, it's neat. It's neat to see people pull their music in. Not all of us necessarily go into professional musicianship, although I was in bands in Chicago for right. years. I actually still am in a band, but you know, it's nice to, to incorporate it. So how, how great that you can take your original your original tunes and put them uh, to work every morning for yeah, absolutely. It is it is it is a wonderful opportunity, and I do take it. I mean, like I said, I have two CDs. I'm, I'm, I want to go back into the studio shortly at some point to start a third. Just that the, the the spirit hasn't been there yet, but it's beginning. I can beginning to feel it. Some more yeah. original tunes coming through. So, all right, now I, I, in terms of like you said, even when you were younger, you knew you wanted. It's kind of like if we watched the Charlie Brown cartoon and Lucy would put up the psychology box and say five cents for advice. I mean, it's kind of like so you, you knew because a very few people that I know it, and when they were little, they said I want to be a psychologist. So what was that like for you in terms of picking courses or did it drive what courses you took in high school or, or how, how did it, I'm, I'm working my way through, we get to the book. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, so I would agree. Yeah, very few people know that. And, and like I said, I had this notion I wanted to help people, but I certainly didn't have any kind of roadmap for how I would get there. And so I did stumble a, a, around for a while. I did take a psych course in high school. There was one that was offered and I really fell madly in love with it. And then but then I got to college, and it was still kind of like, well, let's just take some gen ed and see what I'm resonating with and which subjects are kind of getting me excited. And so I ended up double majoring because I didn't even pick a major until my junior year. So I was still meandering around for a while, but certainly finding that I loved my literature courses and my psych courses the best. And so finally junior year, uh, my advisor was like, so, uh, Karen, there's this thing called a major, and we need to have one in college. <laughs> so I couldn't pick yeah, I know. I was like, really? <laughs> no, but yeah, so I couldn't pick one, so I picked two. And yeah, and it, it, again, when you look back, when you're where we are in life, you look back and you see it all coming together, even though right. in the midst of it, it's sometimes a bit scary and daunting because you don't see clearly. But of course, now, as I'm a psychologist and an author, it makes sense that I majored in psychology and literature. So. So now, okay, so prior to doing the professorship or going into academia, you actually were the psychologist. Now, one of my favorite shows, I will tell you, of all times is Frasier. Yeah. It's the combination of him being a psychologist as well as a radio talk show host. So, right. I mean, and, and then he has, between him and his brothers and the father and that dynamic going on and Daphne and all that, they have like this really like dry sense of humor that to me is funny as heck. But in any yeah. event, like... On that show, they're always trying to diagnose what... So when people came to you or come to you, you actually... I mean, everybody has this picture of putting folks on the couch. Right. Is that what it is? You you know, folks just sit there and talk and you listen and you kind of get a feel for what's going on? Or talk a little bit about what does a psychologist do? Right. Well, so my background in therapy was mostly with kids. So I was working with kids in the child welfare system in the south side of Chicago. So it was a little different than that because with kids, they obviously, I mean, 
kids don't, first of all, they don't want to talk to somebody. Usually they don't want to talk to an adult. They feel like that they're in therapy, that that makes them different or crazy. You know, they, they don't understand. They, they can sometimes take that experience and make it something negative or that that's their perception. And so with kids, you don't do, like I was saying, you, you don't want to really sit in front of them and like, let's have a conversation with an adult. Yay, that'd be fun. You know, so you try to make it more interactive. And then, I mean, with play therapy for the little ones, with groups for the older ones so that they can understand you're not the only one who's going through this stuff. That can be very healing just in and of itself as you normalize their experiences. And then um, you do a lot of, like, especially with my young boys, we would just take walks because, I mean, I'm sure you found with kids, if you're talking but you're side by side, sometimes you get more information than if you're sitting down, like looking like you're interrogating them. And so, and there's... During that answer, there's a couple of things you brought up that I want to touch on, and I want to get back to the child thing in a second, but there was something you talked about equating going to therapy with crazy. And Mm -hmm. those two, I mean, that I think is one of the biggest stigmas in terms of people seeking therapy, that they will somehow feel that if they go to therapy, people will think, or the psychologist for that matter, will think they are crazy, when that's not the case. There is not necessarily a relationship between crazy and therapy. Talk a little bit about that. Oh, I'm so glad you bring that up. That's something that's such an important topic and one that's still, sadly, in many circles, is still, uh, there's a stigma. And it's so, I mean, a great example, I might be at a cocktail party or out with friends and someone might start to talk to me about something because, I mean, I don't even know if it, if they, even if they don't know I'm a psychologist, like if it's someone I've just met and we just kind of meander into a conversation, I might say something. And from my perspective, it's coming as like, well, of course I would say this. Something like, oh, wow, you know, that's something that probably a counselor could help you with. And they sometimes are taken aback. And how could someone say that to me? And I just met them. And I'm thinking, if you came to me and you complained about a Tuesday, what would I tell you? Right? Absolutely. I'd say, I'd say hey, how about talking to a dentist about that. I think they can help you out, right? And so we take our physical health and our dental hygiene, and we understand that they're professionals who have trained, and their entire raison d'etre is to help you with that aspect of your life. And yet the same thing is true with counselors and psychotherapists, and yet we still have this, this hesitancy to go get the help we need. And to me, the healthiest people are the ones that seek help with their emotional and their psychological lives. And the less healthy, so the ones that are closer to crazy, if we're going to right. say anyone is crazy, which we're not, but if we were, the people who are the most crazy are the ones who resist and refuse. Absolutely. Do you even find, because, it, and I hate, and I know with everything that's going on around the country, or around the world for that matter, everything always for some reason boils down to race or ethnic group. But do you find that? Uh, it varies between racial groups. Do you find that it varies between African Americans versus Caucasians versus Hispanics versus males versus females? Do you find that there's different patterns there? Yeah, so there is some of that going on. My So in the South Side of Chicago, my population, I was working with the kids were African American by and large and some Latino. And then my first academic position was at Chicago State University, which is in the south side of Chicago, and also primarily an academic institution made up of African-American um, and mostly first-generation college students. So you see some of that with um, populations that are just uncomfortable with, with therapy. And so the African-American community, from my experience and also the, the literature, do show that, that, that they are more hesitant than other populations, also men you find that men are much less willing to go to, to psychotherapy and to get counseling, and that's probably based on how we socialize men. We still in this culture, despite <laughs> the, the gender equality movements uh, and, and the women's liberation movement that we are now, that are now like old news, but we still socialize men to be tough and hard and don't talk about my feelings, and the only feeling I'm actually permitted to have is anger. Because that's manly. Correct. But any other, any other emotion makes me weak um, instead of just makes you who you are, which is human, right? Because we have the range of emotions. Correct. And they're, God, they're God-given, and they're there for a reason because they indicate to us what's going on with us even before sometimes we're aware. So if we take a look at our emotions, we're, we're getting a window into our, our inner state that is very valuable and important. 
but but uh, and I feel bad for men. This is a whole body of research that's going on looking at how we are discriminating against men because we're still socializing them to be um, almost robots. And You're abso- robotic and, and, yeah, and absolutely and right. Also. And I'll tell you, one of the biggest fights I have, and every time I post something on Facebook or social media about men have the same emotions as women, I get all this pushback about, oh, men are sorry, what is it that, oh, oh." I get all kinds of, oh, a man needs to stand up to be a man. I get all kinds of pushback when I say, wait a minute, the same thing women are looking for in terms of affirmation, in terms of anything else uh, emotionally, men are looking for the same thing. Now, I get our socialization, that I get. But at the same time, you can't just sit there and run over a man feeling as if, well, a man doesn't have any feelings. Because the truth of the matter mm-hmm. is, he does. Oh, yeah. And I agree with you. I mean, we have to be uh, a critical um, observers of our own socialization and what we do, I mean, what we've experienced personally and then what we see happening to those around us. And then as adults, it's time to, 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 to get in there and go, okay, yes, maybe I was socialized in this way, but now I'm grown and I have a Correct. choice as to how much I decide I'm going to take in and take on and how much I don't. And I will fault the women also, though, because sometimes, and this gets back to the dating piece, sometimes you hear women saying, well, he's just too nice. Right. And, and well, we are... You know- we are definitely going there. I want you to stay because we're going to go, we're going to shift into the book momentarily. So I'm glad you brought that up because her book is, which we're going to have some fun with. Single is the new black. Don't wear right till it's don't wear white till it's right. Praise for single is the new black. And again, the author is Dr. Karen Anderson Abril, and she's on the line with me right now. And I want to, I'm going to put a pin right there because we're going to come back to that. But there's something you said when we were talking about the kids, and I work in an urban area as well, just like the Chicago area, if not worse. No, I don't think it could be worse. It's close. It's 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 on par. From what I understand, my city was rated the the third worst city in the country. I don't know how true it is, but it was right up there. <laughs> so right. so the the students that I serve, when you're talking about children going to psychology, I mean it is, and I'm, this is not a surprise to you, I know, but. The children that I serve in the urban area that I serve, they have seen more sex, death, drugs, drama in like five or six years than I've seen in 54. Yes. So when you now have a child and you have to now kind of try to peel the onion back to try to get to what really is at the root, because, you know, all the teachers just think, oh, they're just angry. Oh, they just don't know how to act. Oh, they're not being raised. Not realizing there's a there's a root cause. So when you start talking about the root with the children, kind of what do you come up with? Oh, it, yeah, the cause is exactly what you talked about. It's um, and it's, it's it's such a term now in psych that it's almost played out. Is trauma, 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 trauma. Right. Because I mean, it, to your point, like I mean, the, kid, the things. So I was, I'm 24 years old and I've graduated with my master's and I moved to the, to the city, and I want to, and I had, I had, a, I don't know where this came from either necessarily, but I always had a heart for the urban context, and so I wanted to work in, with, with an environment where you're dealing with kids who have seen, I don't know, again, I don't know where I came up with this, but that was just, I could, I had that, that pull on my heart, and these kids, I, so I'm 24 years old, and I'm starting to meet with these kids and just get to know them as we're starting the, the therapy, and I would read their case files, I mean, I would be sobbing reading these case files. I mean, just sobbing, just, just like, what? Like, how? How, like, how could someone permit their child right. to go through this? I mean, just unspeakable. I mean, we really can't even talk about it. We just bring us down too much. And so when you think, so I would have these kids, because part of a psychological evaluation is an, an IQ test, of course, because they want to see what we're dealing with on all facets of the kid's life. Right. And these kids would be, they'd be scoring like in levels that I knew were way lower than what they they were capable of. And I mean, I'm getting like borderline mental retardation with these kids in terms of the scores they're getting. And I'm thinking, no way. I just had a conversation with this kid. This kid is very, very bright. And so, but you have to realize that what these kids, they don't have the wherewithal to sit and take a test. Of right. their intellectual, I mean, of their intellectual functioning rather because they're worried that they're going to go home. Correct. And mom's boyfriend is going to beat the crap out of Absolutely. them. Absolutely. You know, like, they do not have it because they're in survival mode. So when you talk about the root, when you think about, I mean, just the physiological response to survival mode, is like heightened cortisol levels because of the chronic stress. I mean, we're talking about a, a, just a, a, a day-to-day state, physiologically, psychologically, that I cannot fathom, that most of us could probably only understand if we looked at some, like, 
show, like Survivor or something like, you know, something where you would have to understand that you are always on the defense, always ready for the attack from your home, from your home, which is supposed to be the safest place that a child knows, the safest place that all of us know. And these kids are just denied that from the beginning of their lives. Absolutely. And and, and I'm listening here with the mic off, shaking my head profusely in the up and down direction, meaning I affirm. And I'm saying that because I have to share that with my teachers constantly. And I get, you know, because I was a teacher prior to being a principal. um, I I understand what it's like to have a classroom full of kids who don't listen or jumping around or whatever. But at the same time, I also understand exactly what you just said. I mean, I was having a conversation the other day and somebody said, you know, a lot of kids are or they really are suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome, just like if they've been in the war. I, I, I literally, I mean, in the neighborhood that my school sits, I mean, we, literally people are getting killed around the perimeter of the school. People are getting shot. This stuff like we're seeing in the news around the world happens right there in my little microcosm. <laughs> and, oh, yeah. and the kids see that. They're walking past drug dealers to get to school. They're stepping over, you know, homeless. They're, and yet they're still coming there because you're, you're right. The school and the home is supposed to be the two safest places they should be able to be. But that is impacts their psyche and just what you just said they're in survival mode and we're we're expecting them to react the same way a child who is not in survival mode acts exactly right and i'm i'm just w- w- laughing with sadness of just how obvious this is and yet how it's always missed right. always 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 we're always expecting of these kids something that they, that no child would be capable of, that no adult would be capable of, frankly. Right. If I came home every night and I was scared to death as to what was going to happen on the way home and in the home, I wouldn't be able to perform very well on any kind of testing either. So and, 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 the, and the crazy part of that is, alongside of what we're talking about, and I'm a little bit older than you, but I do know whenever I was in school, we only had one standardized test for the year. It was called the CAT test, the California Achievement Test. That was the only one we had. It was in the spring. Nobody made any big deal about it. Every kid knew we were doing the CAT in spring. That was it. But now our kids are tested on a daily basis, and they are usually a state-related or some type of district-related or standardized test. So when you combine that with what we just talked about, you wonder why you're not seeing on paper academic achievement. But like you said, if you ever engage any of these kids in conversation, they're extremely bright. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you're right. I mean, just the, the incessant testing it increases the already high levels of anxiety. Exactly. And, 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 and we know, I mean, look, there's a body of research in psych called stereotype threat. So when these kids get a little bit older and they start to understand how they're perceived and how well, I'm a kid from the inner city, and no one expects me to do very well, how that will also affect their performance. And this is like, I mean, this is like indisputable. I mean, it's been tested over and over again. So it's not something that just people go, oh, well, maybe they're affected by that. No, no, they are. Because we all are. We're no, all, uh, we're it is. All You're absolutely. Mm-hmm. Some years ago, I taught a diversity course, and we used to do different little uh, experiments throughout the, the two or three day seminar. And one of them was in terms of what you're constantly being told versus your rising to the expectation, whether it be negative or positive. And we would throw out the stereotypes such as dumb jock, you know, for the athletes. And we would have some people in the room that would literally say, since people expected me to be dumb because I was an athlete, I acted like I was dumb. So (laughs) constantly what you're told is what you will eventually begin doing. And you're right. It has been proven out. And I know from just our little sessions that we had there time and time again, people would say whatever it is that folks expected of me or the stereotype. After a while, I began to do that. Oh, yeah. Which which is one of the reasons I have a problem with the overdiagnosing in my field as well, because You've got little kids, you know, a little boy who's just got a lot of energy. All of a sudden, he's ADHD. And you've got a kid who's non-compliant because of all the trauma, right. the PTSD, as you put it. And then he's bipolar. And right. that's all overdiagnosed. No, right. it's, it's, and then that, the label, that. what does he do? Live up to the label, just like you said. Just live up to the label. Actually, I did an in-service. I'm, I'm glad, you know, just circling back to talking about instructing teachers, one of my best friends, my former college roommate, actually is a principal in Southside Chicago, in uh, at a K to eight building, and she had me come in to talk to her teachers before the school year. I think it was two years ago about this notion. There's a, a a construct called the looking glass self, which tries to crystallize and concretize what we've been talking about. Like the idea that we, as as we're developing, we look to others 
for that mirror right. to provide us understanding of who we are. So the looking glass self. So I'm looking to other people, again, especially when I'm young, but even as adults. Well, who am I is partly based on the reflection that I'm seeing in, of myself through others. Absolutely. And to remind these teachers, please, please do not just give this kid a reflection that he is negative, that he is stupid, that he is not going to achieve, that he is somehow flawed and worthless. Because the teachers, of course, they inherit what they've heard. The third grade teacher hears what the second grade teacher had to say about this kid. And right. then all of a sudden, you know, and that reminds me of another funny story from another friend from college. So she was teaching second grade, and she used to meet with the kids um, at the end of first grade so they would know their teacher for the next year. And this one little kid comes to her at the end of his first grade year, and you know, she's like, oh, I'm going to be a second grade teacher. And he goes, well, I know you've heard I'm bad. <laughs> you know, wow. just setting her up, right? Wow. And Ari, Ari had, it, had Ari internalized this label, right? And uh, she looks at him and she goes, I don't remember his name. I'll make it up. You know, she's like, oh, Trevor, there's no being bad in second grade, didn't you know? And he looks at her like, huh? <laughs> and, it, she t- and literally, true story, she goes, I didn't have a problem with him all year. She flipped the I script. Sh- she, right. She it. She's like, oh, guess what? We're not doing that. <laughs> That's right. We don't right. have badness in second grade. <laughs> That's and right. I like, I told her, I said, well, you should write a book about that. I mean, that's just powerful. But she's absolutely right, and I'll, and I'll tell yes. you why. Because I tell the teachers to tell the kids from the from the beginning when they step foot in your class, tell them they already have the A. They already they already have it. It's their job to keep it. Because there's a Love difference that. from I already have the A versus I have to earn the A. In other words, you already got it. Now it's your job to keep it. That's I try. It's, it. it's a, it's a really about reframing. So your friend did exactly. Yeah. What, yes. what <laughs> and yes. the, and the child had to like oh okay they don't do bad and grade. all right so I tell you what those of you in the listening audience if you've just joined, and I truly hope you've been with us since six because it's been a fun and fascinating interview and there's even more fun and fascination to come as we shift gears because I'm I'm, I'm wetting your appetite and I'm working our way up to Dr. Karen's book Single Is the New Black because not only did she work with children she now shifted and started working in terms of relationships and that's what we're going to talk about in the next segment as we come back and, and this is what happens doctor even though the show is slated for an hour usually we run over and i'm grateful and thankful i actually have a three-hour slot and i have the flexibility to kind of stay within the three hours i can use them kind of for the most part as i wish so generally when the conversation flows as quickly as this one is flowing because a half hour plus is already gone we usually run over if the guest has the time uh, so we may have a hard stop at seven depending on your schedule or if the conversation continues in the vein that it is we're probably one and over. I'm just kind of setting you up now. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I'm I'm open. So let's keep going. Great. All right. So I'm going to take a. Uh information sharing time. I stopped saying breaks because I don't want anybody to go anywhere. But I do want you to go and on all your social media sites and let someone know Dr. Karen's on the air with me. We're having a blast. Now, we've been talking about children in this first half hour, but we're getting ready to shift gears and talk about relationships and adults. And, you know, truth be told, uh, Dr. Karen, for me, there's not that much difference between, in my mind, and I could be wrong, between children and adults. I honestly believe all of us as our adults are just big kids in an older body. Because I know for me, I mean, my kids... My kids at the school, as well as my personal kids, they think I'm the biggest kid going. I tell them right off the bat, I am. I truly love to play. I usually, I truly love to have fun. I play just as many video games and all this other stuff that they do. And they they look at me like, you do? Yes. When I go home, I'm just like you. I honestly think adults really are just uh, larger children. And so a lot of the same things that apply to kids apply to adults, and in many cases, vice versa. So when we start talking about relationships and everything, a lot of the same things, I have a feeling, and I could be wrong, that you share or or deal with with the children are the same things that you deal with with the adults. So we're going to talk a little bit about that when we come back. Don't you go anywhere. Make sure you let someone know Dr. Karen is on the line. I saw your post. I I retweeted it. (laughs) And I, I encourage you all to do the same in terms of on your social media sites as I share this information with you. Having a place to go after school will make you a better student. Having an outlet to express yourself will make you a better artist. Having something to do together will make you a better family. At The Y, we're helping build better friends, listeners, writers, swimmers, scientists, and musicians one chance at a time. Get the gift of opportunity. Support The Y at ymca.net. The Y for a better us. 
How can I make money in the music business? Why copyright? Should I make a CD anymore? Trying to break into the music and entertainment biz? Wondering how the business works? Wondering how guys like Elton John and MC Hammer go bankrupt? Why am I not making any cash? Tune in to WP Brave New Radio every Wednesday night at 8 o'clock. Hang with the university's music business faculty hosts, me, Steve Marconi. And me, Dave Phil. Plus, we'll have industry guests and students from the music management program. How do I get gigs down at the shore? Call in with your questions and hear the latest in industry happenings. How do I get my music on iTunes? How do I get on a tour? It's Music Biz 101 and more every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Only on WP Brave New Radio. Your secretary's got our checks, right? Mine's direct deposit, I think. <laughs> You're listening to The Reading Circle with Mark Medley on Brave New Radio. Ah, yes, indeed. You're listening to The Reading Circle with your host, Mark Medley. And we're shifting gears just a little bit with Dr. Karen Anderson Abrell. And her book is Single is the New Black. Don't wear white till it's right. Oh, I feel like Johnny Cochran when if it don't fit, you must acquit. <laughs> don't wear white until it's right. <laughs> And the song in the background, interestingly enough, as I was sharing with you, they are my original music. And the title of this song playing as we open back up is What Could Have Been. And that song was pinned title to relationships. So we're going to kick the segment off with What Could Have Been. And the book is Single Is the New Black. Don't wear white till it's right. So you were dealing with the children in, in the school system as a psychologist. And then you went into academia in terms of professorship and teaching and then you started dealing or maybe all at the same time dealing with this whole notion of relationships so let's let's rewind the tape to that how do we get into that what 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 drove the relationship piece right well so yes i was a professor for 10 years and i loved teaching i loved like i said five years at chicago state university and then five years at concordia concordia university chicago but through it all i was course, dealing with my own personal life, my own psychological state, and I was dating and doing what we do when we're looking for love, and and I uh, actually got engaged to, I think you brought this up in my bio as well, I was engaged uh, to a guy I met when I was 30, turned 30, met him, and then got engaged at 33, and then two months before the wedding, when I was 34, I called off my wedding, and it was one of those things where... I just started digging deep and realizing that it wasn't feeling right. But here I am. I'm an academic. And so, you know, I'm a scientist. I'm a soft scientist right. as a psychologist, but I'm still a scientist. That's so right. I, yeah, I had, had, I had had some of that struggle of, well, it just because something doesn't, doesn't feel right doesn't mean it's not right. And, um, and you'll appreciate this. After all this, my, uh, my father told me that uh, a quote by Leonard Bernstein is feeling is the highest form of knowing. <laughs> but I had not listened to my feelings. I mean, actually, we were just talking about that earlier, that I was trying to stuff my feelings because I'm 33 now, right. and it's time to get married. And a nice, upstanding, successful, really super whip-smart <laughs> guy who I truly enjoy time with had asked me to marry him. So don't you say yes? Isn't that what you do? And then as I proceeded in the engagement, I got caught up in the wedding hype, like many women do, and it was so fun to finally be the bride after being the bridesmaid, and it took <laughs> a year of me being engaged and going through all the motions and yet not feeling what I thought a bride should be feeling as she was preparing for her wedding, and finally, two months before, I just hit that bottom, which of course, oftentimes our bottom is actually, talking about a reframe, is actually the best thing that can happen to us, because I finally went... I can't do this. Right. I'm doing this for all the wrong reasons, and I can't live a lie. I just can't be a person living a lie. And, and so despite the fact that he was a great guy, and frankly, because he was a great guy, it was harder. If he'd been a jerk and been abusing me or been emotionally cruel, it would have been easy to get out. But when he's a great guy and there's nothing 
on paper that says you shouldn't be a great match, but in your heart of hearts you know he's not your guy, that's when it's toughest. So I did what many people do, and certainly a psychologist will do. I go to the self-help section looking for help and couldn't find a resource that was speaking to my need. And so that's when I started stepping into the, the writing space and going, okay, yeah, I've, I've written a dissertation. I've done all types of academic writing, which is great and important, but I really want to be a voice to the masses, like we were saying earlier as well, to people who maybe wouldn't feel comfortable even going to therapy, but they might sneak into the self-help section and grab a book and then become encouraged and empowered. Well, ironically, you're my second guest over the last month that actually called off an engagement, called off a wedding. Yeah, and, and wow. my, my guest, either the last, because I wasn't on last week because of the holiday, but either the guest prior to that week or prior to that one, she did the same thing. And kind of this conversation, some of it will be very similar in terms of the courage that it takes to do that especially whenever you're constantly being hit with, and the older you get, unfortunately, what we do, and I don't know if other countries do this or not, but uh, you start getting all these crazy questions that never end, by the way. Why aren't you married? <laughs> when are you going to get married? What, mm -hmm. What's wrong with you? Why, you know, what's the problem? And then once you get married, and why I say they never stop, is because the next question will be when you're going to have children. And mm -hmm. then depending on which sex of the child that you have, if you have a boy, is when you're going to have the girl. And if you have a girl, is when mm -hmm. you're going to have the boy. And then it just never ends. Or when you're going to have the... So it's just always there, but there's always kind of like this pressure of having yeah. to do something. And like you were just talking about, am I doing this for the right reason? And right. and then when everything from the outside looks the part, you really kind of have to like, wow, what are people going to say about this whenever I, <laughs> I call this thing off? <laughs> uh, so you got yeah. all those different dynamics going. And so let's talk a little bit about everything that was going on with that and how it led you to the book in terms of it's OK to be single. If, right. you know, if you wait until, and, and I'm laughing because my daughter's in the process of buying a car, and she's, she just graduated college in May. She has to get a car because she just got a new job, and she's, like, really pushing this thing. I'm like, take your time and work mm -hmm. through the process. There's more than one car dealer. Don't be so quick. I mean, so it's kind of like that same dynamic going on. You feel this pressure from everything around you as to why you should do this, when the reality is you can push back. Because the other yeah. thing, as I was sharing with the other guests, is, it is, and this is from one who wound up being on the divorced end, it is much cheaper to say no prior <laughs> to the wedding than it is after. <laughs> yes. So let's talk about that yes. whole thing. Well, you know, yeah, and it's something that I've examined quite a bit and actually did delve into the psych research. I mean, we, we like we said earlier, we are socialized and we have these milestones, and many of us, that, that, that come from from society in quotes, because I know there's no such thing really as society per se that's speaking to us, but we certainly uh, we, we consume messages from various factions of society. And, and, and we, in my head, I have these milestones, like I was supposed to be married by 30, you know, with a, already a baby on the way. That's how my life was supposed to play out. And so the twofold pressure these, the external pressure and then the internal pressure that I had put on myself after I internalized everything that I'd heard. But then also, I mean, I think we are created to be in partnership. So we have this very deep, which I do believe is probably God-given desire to, to walk in hand through life with someone. So it, there's so much pressure. Like I said, some, some of it from the outside and some of it from the inside that we, we desire this, that sometimes we're willing to force something it's not quite right because it's good enough. And then some people just walk through it. And, and actually, I've done tons of interviews with, because um, that's the next book actually is about calling off the wedding. And I'm almost done with that one. But um, I did a lot of interviews with people like yourself who were divorced, who went, Karen, I knew the day of, I knew down deep. But I just couldn't, I couldn't call it off at that point. Too many people had flown in from California. I mean, one of my best girlfriends told me, she said, I was in the narthex of the church, in my gown, with my dad. I was actually the maid of honor at her wedding. She's like, and I'm up there with my dad, and I remember just the, the only thought I was having as I'm getting ready to walk down the aisle for my marriage is I'm wishing my dad would look at me and say, Claire, you don't have to do this. There's a limo, wow. and I can hop in the limo, and we're out.
that was the most clear memory she has <laughs> walking down the aisle. You know, and so when I called off my wedding, she was just like high-fiving me and how brave and afraid as you are. And I felt like a failure. I felt like I had been very capricious with my fiance's emotions and broken his heart. And I, you know, I was 34. You know, I wasn't a baby. You know, how do I, and I'm a psychologist to boot. (laughs) I should not be the one who let this thing go on as long as it did, if it weren't going to be the one for me and and the marriage for me. And so I, uh, yeah, I was really beating myself up. And so it was, it was helpful at that point to have some of my friends go, no, 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 no. You did the, you did the smartest thing. You did the strongest thing. You, you, you really, and to your point, (laughs) the cheapest thing, (laughs) because well, because, you know, you then you have the fallout of, of just the, the family breaking up and, and all of that. And, of course, you know, kids can survive that and they right. get through it. But also, if we can avoid some of that, it'd be great. So, <laughs> you know, so, yeah, my, my, my point now is to, I want to get that other book out because, again, it's, there are a few resources. If you go to the, to the wedding section uh, at the bookstore, they're going to tell you how to have the perfect wedding. <laughs> of course. And your money, and they're going to tell you how to have the flowers but they're not going to ask you to examine if you're in this engagement for the right reasons. No, and you're absolutely right. I'm looking here again on your website under the book where it says, be happy, hopeful, and positive because the happy you are when single, the happy you mm-hmm. will be when married. And one of the things, one of the advice I always get, I give it to my kids and people are like, how many kids do you have? I said 543. And they're like, well, who, mm-hmm. who are you? Are you like Moses? Are you like Abraham? What, what, what do you mean by that? Well, I'm the principal of school, but I have four kids kids two biological two steps but i don't get into steps and all of that so i have four Mm -hmm. kids that are mine that i support so forth and so on and then the other 500 at the school but the advice i always give them and it's kind of like advice was given me that i did not heed but that was you know be single for some time and Mm -hmm. travel get your education get to know who you are live in an apartment on your own for a little while then if, you know, Mr. or Ms. Wright come along, at least you're comfortable with who you are. And that's kind of like to your point of being mm-hmm. happy single, because your second bullet hit me as well in terms of stay strong amidst prevailing single shaming messages. Mm-hmm. And see, that's back to those questions we were just talking about. People actually try to put you in this box. You're still mm-hmm. single. You're good looking. You're attractive. You're a young lady. Why aren't you? What's wrong with you? Why? I mean, it gets into this craziness of of people Someone once told me that when people have an issue with you, it's because of their picture, not necessarily mm-hmm. your picture. So in other yeah. words, because you're messing up their picture, that's why they have an issue with you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so in, in their mind, you should be married and you're not, so something's wrong with you. So, I mean, it's interesting that you say stay strong amidst prevailing single shaming. Because, mm-hmm. you know, it's the same thing. Like, I mean, I, I think uh, those who are virgins go through the same thing. Like people go, like, what, you're still a virgin? What, you haven't had sex? Like, it, it, I think it's kind of like that same thing, virgin shaming. It's like, again, <laughs> it messes up somebody else's picture so they want to put that mess up of their picture on you right. talk, talk about that in terms of the, what you're trying to get across there to folks well yeah that's exactly the reason I wrote the book because when I caught off my wedding I was 34 and I really had to I literally and figuratively look myself in the mirror and say Karen this could be it you know I mean you don't know you may never get married and you may never have kids and you may never have the, the little picture perfect life that you had envisioned. But I, it was a watershed moment. I, I said to myself, you know what? I'd rather be happy, single, and living an authentic life than <laughs> continue to, to, to try to phone this in because of everyone else's, like you said, everyone else's agenda for my life. And I remember, I mean, you have these really clear memories. I remember. Um, the Valentine's Day that I was engaged, so it was February, and I was getting married that May. And I remember we're out for Valentine's Day with my former fiancé, and I remember looking across the restaurant at these couples who were so in love, and here I am engaged. <laughs> and I remember looking at them going, gosh, I want to feel that. I don't feel that. <laughs> and I'm getting married in a couple months. You know, so, yeah, exactly. I mean, like, so, so twisted, but that is ironic. Yes, right. <laughs> you say it, it twisted. That's right. That is ironic. Yeah. So here, so at that point, it became very clear for me what my path was going to be, and I knew. Listen, I know how to make myself happy because I know every morning, 
it's my job. God and I, every morning, decide that I'm going to be happy. Correct. I, I, so I stopped looking for, well, then the husband will make me happy and we'll have the right car and we'll have the condo in Chicago. And, and I realized, you know, what's going to make you happy is you and God every morning, with or without a man. And the story. Yes, and that's the point. You have to get both male and female too. That you you need to be complete yourself prior to whoever it is that you're going to be your mate. Because if you're looking for that other person to complete you, you're going to run into issues. And again, I applaud anyone who can take that step to say, you know what, I'm not feeling this. I don't, you know, I I understand we've gone down this road because you said something. I think I saw it in the bio, and I even chuckled when I saw it. There is a difference between loving someone and being in love. They're two mm-hmm. different things. Being in love with someone and loving someone, they're two different things, and a lot of people use them interchangeably. Oh, yeah. They do, and I, and I think oftentimes they do because they don't want to make the distinction. Or they don't believe. They may have lost hope that, that true love, which sounds so corny and cliche, that, that it's available for them. But I just knew, you know, getting back to the question about just being single and happy, I just knew that I could be happy and I was going to be happier solo, knowing that I was living a life of integrity and I hadn't, like, I mean, let's think about the other piece. Like, I called off a wedding, but I also didn't, and it took me a while to get here in my mind, to realize I didn't dupe a guy into thinking that he was the one. Right. Now, I almost did. I almost did. <laughs> and that was not cruel. I mean, that was not loving and kind. That was cruel. You know, I felt that initially because I broke his heart because he expected we were going to get married and we'd spent four years together. Right. You know, but the crueler thing would have been to walk down that aisle, make vows that I couldn't keep because they were lies. I didn't mean to be a big fat liar, but I was. That would have been crueler instead of freeing him up. And initially it was hard, of course, for both of us, but freeing him up to find the love of his life. And I think some people don't just, they don't believe it's available to them. They think it's Disney movies and they've given up. And so they go, okay, good enough will do. Or any I, old man or any old woman will do. Right. But I mean, one of the I things, that, right? And one of the things you just touched upon that is critical. There's nothing worse. Had let's say, for example, hypothetically, you had gone down that road knowing what you felt. There is nothing worse than to be in a relationship and going through the motions. That's kind of like what you just said. I'm sitting there at the table on Valentine's Day and looking at other folks saying, gee, I wish I had that. There's nothing worse than going through the motions yeah. on either end because the person that's receiving that, they, their vibe pick up on that. Wait a minute. Something's not, you're not connected here. Right. They pick up on that as well. And then you eat that and that causes a whole nother host of issues of which you avoid it by calling off the wedding now you may not see that i mean i'm quite sure he didn't feel that at the time maybe not i don't know but i'm you know at short term it may seem crazy but long term like i said just going through the motions miserable and life is too short for that that's for sure exactly and i've had it heard it put this way one time in my late 20s i was with some friends and one of my girlfriends had gotten married in her early 20s and i didn't know her very well i was just getting to know her and we were getting on the topic of being single and some of us were moaning and groaning about being single and how hard it was to meet people, blah, 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 blah. And she was the married one in the bunch. And she looks over at us. She goes, you know, you guys may be lonely sometimes, but there's no one more lonely than someone alone in a marriage. I couldn't agree more. As a matter of fact, yep. I, I posted something on Facebook about that about, about a month ago, maybe two or three weeks ago. I saw something along those same lines. Lonely is one thing. Lonely with a partner is another. That's a dis- distinction That's, as well. That's exactly right. And that, those words echoed with me, and, and through the next couple of years, as I was still out there single, I just remember thinking, okay, you know, if you have a lonely night here and there, at least you still have the hope of potential. And to your point, I, once I called off the wedding, there was no going through the motions. It was, it's either going to be extraordinary, it's either going to be the merit of, like, of what fairy tales are made of, or else I'm cool. I'm good. Well, you know what you, you- got? You, you actually, that was my next question in terms of the hope is that whenever you have an experience like that, that you learn what you don't want and become very in tune with what you do want. And yes. you just answered that question for me because it's kind of like with the, like for those of us who have been in divorce or, or bad relationship or changed it or, or had to bow out of it or whatever, the, the thinking is, okay, now you've had the experience of everything that you don't want. So when you now start looking again, you should now have the objective of saying, okay, I know what I don't want, but I know what I do want. And and now you start looking for those characteristics. Um, so 
if you, as a psychologist, because this is where it really gets ironic and, and, and funny too, if you mm-hmm. were now diagnosing you or you were you <laughs> coming to you as the psychologist, what would you tell you? Yeah, so you're so right. And, 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 and that's the problem we see with some folks, though, where, you know, the woman marries the alcoholic and then divorces him and then marries another alcoholic and divorces him and marries a third alcoholic. So just repeating, <laughs> what's the definition of, this yes. of insanity, you know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Doing the same thing over again, expecting it to be different, right? So, so what I would tell someone, um, and I've had these conversations, you know, women reach out to me. I actually had a young woman I speak at colleges. And I had a young woman I spoke a couple of years ago, and then a year later, reach out via email and say, you know, I remember you telling your story, and I'm engaged, and I'm supposed to get married in a couple of months, and I'm not sure. So over email, I just went back and forth with her, not telling her what to do, but just trying to help her. Like we were saying earlier, I held up a mirror. I'm trying to hold up a mirror to help her see herself more clearly, because what you're telling me, young woman... <laughs> is that you're not in love with this guy. Right. And you like the idea of the security, again, in quotes, right, uh, that it comes from marriage. And certainly when we launch after college, that's a time when sometimes some people, even in this day and age, are looking to, okay, stepping into real adult world, that's going to be a little scary. Let me just lock someone in so I can step with them. But as we've been saying, stepping into adult life or into any life with someone who's not meant to be your partner is it's a recipe for disaster, and it. And I'm so glad that you're counseling the young people, that your kids, and the other young people you know. I mean, I wish someone had been very clear with me. Like the best way to go about adulthood is to take several years, right? Several years on your own, and the data actually support that because most recent stats show that the older we are at the age of first marriage, the less likely we are to divorce. Right. And 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 and, 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 yeah. and and again, you, you, which supports your whole notion of uh, finally marrying Mr. Right at forty-two. I mean, I think societal pressure, or whatever. I mean, because if you look on every magazine cover, if Jennifer Aniston is not on there, it's somebody with a wedding gown. Actually, even if it is Jennifer, yeah. it's Jennifer in a wedding gown. But I mean, everything is <laughs> <laughs> everything is promoted towards this fairy tale, mm-hmm. and people feel as if. I don't fall into that fairy. It's almost like this whole notion of what beauty is. If I don't fit that measurement, then I'm not beautiful. If I don't have that look, now it's the same. If I'm not married by a certain age, then something is wrong with me. And the other thing you talked about that I picked up on a couple of minutes ago was this. We talked about the distinction between loving somebody, being in love, but there was a third thing that you touched on. And that was this notion or the idea of I'm not necessarily in love, but I love the ideal of being in love. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's another <laughs> dynamic as well. Like, okay, I'm not really in love, but I love the idea. I love this whole thing of the Valentines and the hearts and the cards and the calls and the talk a little bit about oh, that. Yeah. Well, yeah. And it makes me really nervous actually. I mean, again, from my experience and then what I know, what, what the research shows, it makes me nervous when young people, I mean, in their early 20s especially are, and I get pushed back. I spoke at another university recently, and a young woman, you know, at the end, she came up to me. She's like, well, I just feel like everything you said was, like, the anti-marriage. She's like, you know, I'm, she was, like, 20, 21 years old. She's like, I have a very serious boyfriend, and we're probably going to get married right after graduation. And that's, and I was like, listen, I'm not trying to say that everyone who gets married young is, you know, headed for the divorce court a couple years later, but, I mean, do we want to look at the research? Do we not? I mean, do you want to look at the statistics or do you want to not? And I, of course there are outliers. And I, I get it that every once in a while those things work, but I also know from experience and from what the research shows that, that when we fall in love for the right reasons, it's because we know who we are and we really can't know who right. we are until we've had some time with, with ourselves. Yes. Ourselves. And frankly, the latest research on neurology shows that our brains aren't fully mature until at least, 25. Correct. And they hate hearing that. Correct. That's, again, I mean, get in the CAT scan. Check it out. I mean, no, it's is, true. I mean, it's hey. absolutely true. It, 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 we, I had a presenter. We were doing something in the school on higher order thinking questions, and she presented that same body of research. 
Yes. In terms of how our brains don't really. So the fact that you have to constantly say something over and over again is a part of that. And and right. you're questioning because that was a part of her presentation as well. But I tell you what, we did cross over seven o'clock. Let me do what I need to do for the FCC and then we'll continue on with our discussion. Please make sure that you let somebody know that Dr. Karen is on the line because we are talking. We're, ha we're, we're having a good time talking about it, but it is a very serious subject. And there's always that old adage or cliche of the life you save may be your own. Some of this stuff that we're talking about, while it may not physically kill you, we're still talking about the life you save may be your own. Because as we said earlier, the worst thing you want to do is to get locked into a marriage. Because it's different to be in a relationship that you're not married. You can always kind of walk away from that. It's a lot more difficult to walk away from once you get married. It only takes a couple minutes to say I do, but trust me on this one, it's a long time to say I don't once you've said I do legally. <laughs> okay, yeah. so the stuff that we're talking about, we the life and and heartaches and trials and pain and loneliness and second guessing, we, the life we save in those areas may be your own. So let somebody know that we're on the air, and while we're having fun talking about it, it is a serious topic. I'm gonna do what I need to do in terms of the seven o'clock hour, and then we'll continue a little bit more with the discussion. WPSC, Wayne, New Jersey, on the radio, 88.7 FM, online, gobrave.org, a tune-in radio station, part of the William Patterson Broadcast Network. Broadcasting live from Hobart Hall in Wayne, New Jersey. This is The Innovative. I think they're really unique. The Fearless. They have awesome variety. The Kick-Ass. I love Brave New Radio. The Sensational. I've never heard anything like it. This is the one and only Brave New Radio. Straight from the WP 88.7 FM Weather Center, here's your local forecast. All right, 63.8 degrees in the Wayne, New Jersey area. Cloudy skies this morning, followed by scattered showers and thunderstorms during the afternoon. 50% chance of rain. Actually, it was raining when I was coming into the studio. 74 is a high, 64 is a low. Scattered thunderstorms tonight as well. Then tomorrow, Sunday, partly cloudy skies in the morning will give way to cloudy skies during the afternoon. A stray shower or two. Thunderstorms again possible, 82 as a high, 61 as a low. On Monday, partly cloudy skies, high of 83, low of 61, clearing up on Monday night. And on Tuesday, intervals of clouds and sunshine, high of 88, 66 as a low, clear skies. And Wednesday, rounding out the forecast, generally sunny despite a few afternoon clouds, high of around 90. That's right, folks, 9-0. Low of 70, a few clouds from time to time on Wednesday night. That is the weather brought to you right here from the WP 88.7 FM Weather Center. My guest this morning is Dr. Karen Anderson Abril. Abril. And we are talking, <laughs> we are talking relationships. Actually, we're talking psychology, but, you know, we've woven our way from child psychology or working with children on up to adults and all the different pressures and things society and people and relatives place on you if for some reason you find yourself by a certain age not married or not with children. And if you actively choose, you know, I don't want to do that. They look at you like something wrong with you. And interestingly enough, Karen, my mother just texts me. She says, I'm listening. What a good topic. You know, there's, <laughs> and she's down in Georgia. She's in the Georgia area. Good morning, mom. Got your text. I see. I'm glad you're listening. Glad you're enjoying the show. Um, you know, let me tell you, in my mind, what's interesting or what's different in our century. And I would say and maybe I'm trying to see how far back to roll the calendar. And maybe the 50s is too early. I'm not sure where, the, where I'm going with this is there was a time when women got married where the dynamics were a little bit different. You had the husband who was the breadwinner. He went out to work, made the money. The wife stayed home, was a housewife, and she didn't go to school. He went to school, whatever. Everything was, for the most part, dependent upon the man. So it was almost like the woman endured a lot of things most likely women today would not endure, but they stuck out the marriage, like no matter how bad, whether it was the alcoholic or the philanderer or the, or the cheater or the whoever. They stuck it out because it's like, well, I really don't have anywhere to go if I leave this man. In 2016, and as we move further toward this year, 
that dynamic changed tremendously in terms of women working, going to school, getting their own thing, doing their own thing. In other words, brother, I don't have to stay in this. And vice versa, you know, it was it was a lot more it was a lot easier for each one to say, hey, I, you know, I'm out. I'm not doing this because I can I can do bad all by myself. How much has that dynamic changed things as well? Because, again, in the early 1900s or 1800s, whatever, the women was totally dependent on the man. Yeah, I think that's a really important societal shift to take note of. Uh, another piece that is completely just segues from what you're saying is the notion of what we expect in marriage. Because those women prior to the 50s, or maybe even in the 50s, like you said, they couldn't expect a whole lot. And I don't think men expected the same things that we do today. In those days, it was like, hey, if this guy is a good provider, he'll be a good father. And, and be decent enough to me, then that's a good marriage. Whereas nowadays, we want it all. And there's actually a psychologist called Dr. Robert Sternberg, and he talks about what he calls consummate love. So it's the trifecta. We want uh, our best friend. We want that emotional intimacy. We want the commitment, someone who's not going to cheat. And then we want passion. We want fireworks. We want that chemistry. And so he's looking at what people will 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 put up with or settle for, in relationships, but that people primarily, in this day and age anyway, we are saying we want it all. So when we want the total package, then we're less willing to be satisfied if we don't have it, whereas I think in days gone by, people didn't necessarily expect to get that in the first place, so they were okay with good enough. Right. And that's that's interesting. That last line you just said, okay with good enough, because that dovetails with your remain true to yourself and never settle for anything less than an extraordinary relationship. And I think what we've been talking about is people are quick to move or settle based on outside pressures and that internal pressure you talked about. The other piece of that now, as I just talked about, and I shared this a couple of weeks ago with, with my other guests, sometimes you because you'll have the female that may be very highly educated have extremely high standard that may overlook someone who is quote unquote blue collar and it's because they you know like well you know what I, I really since I have my education I want the lawyer versus taking the plumber and sometimes that gets in the way as well that you might very well have had more of the passion and the everything you want from the plumber than the lawyer but because of the the perception and everything you bypass that plumber and take the lawyer and now you're miserable with that person yeah and i and that goes back to to that notion of you need to know yourself and then you need to be really clear clear with your values and if you are finding <laughs> that you just want the the glitz and what is perceived again by society as that that high-powered high-profile job that's attractive to you over the man who's a good, honest, hardworking, loving, devoted man, but you're going to take the rat who dresses up in the three-piece suit every right. day, <laughs> then, then, yeah, then, then you know what? Then you got to own it then. Then you just know that <laughs> that's what I signed up for. Right. And don't complain. <laughs> 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 because... You know, and I'm glad you brought that up because sometimes, you know, I was told I was too picky. I actually have a, an entire chapter in the book. I see about, it. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> about, I was told I was too picky all the time. And so when I sometimes tweet, and of course, you know, in Twitter, there's only so many characters. Correct. When I talk about never settling and too picky, sometimes I get some pushback from people saying, oh, well, you know, that means that she wanted the guy who was making, you know, big money and driving the right car and had the, you know, the right house and blah, 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 blah. And I'm thinking, no, no, that's not at all what I'm talking about. Not at all. I didn't care about any of that. You should just, I mean, I dated, like, a filmmaker who was still, you know, waiting tables in his 30s. I, I dated a, the drummer in my band, you know, guys who were, like, you know, not, struggling, who, who by society standards didn't have it. But I was looking for that heart connection. That's what I wanted. To me, never settle means don't settle for someone that doesn't make your heart pitter-patter. Sex in the City, they called it the Zaza Zoo. I mean, I wanted that thrill because I was afraid that if I didn't have that, I would feel that loneliness because I wouldn't feel the depth of that emotional intimacy. So when I say never settle or I say that you're not being too picky, it's because I'm assuming with my reader and, and my audience, and I'm hoping this is true, that they have known, they've examined themselves, right. they know themselves, they, they can stand by their value choices, 
and that when they refuse to settle or lower the standards, it's because their values are authentic to themselves and also reasonable values, not the value of like, well, he better make six figures. And I'm talking right. about six figures. I'm not, I'm not talking about that at all. I'm talking about the connection in character, the connection in intimacy based on the connection of who you are to people, feeling that intense emotional intimacy, which is what the whole point of marriage to my Absolutely. Mind is supposed to be. And I'm so glad you made that distinction because I hope, listening audience, I hope you heard Dr. Anderson Abril. The standards does not have to necessarily do with the job title or the educational status. She she just said, you need to know who you are. So that if you know who you are and what your standard, it doesn't matter if the man is the plumber or the truck driver. Mm-hmm. Be, because what you're looking for, if he has that, or vice versa, because we have women truck drivers too, we, vice versa, either way, if you know what your standard is and you know what you're looking for, it really doesn't matter what the job title is if you found that in that person. But like you just said a couple of minutes ago, if you fall into that trap of the glitz and the glamour and the title and then you get the schmuck, well, you know <laughs> what, you got to deal with that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you make your bed. Exactly. You I mean... One of the hallmarks, you know, I'm a developmental psychologist, and one of the questions we ask is, when are you an adult? And, you know, it's not 18 necessarily, it's not 21 necessarily, it's not 61 necessarily. It's when you start taking responsibility for your actions and owning it. And we know many adults don't do that, so I'm frankly not really w- willing to label them adults because if we don't take responsibility, then we are out there reckless with our own lives and with others' lives. Absolutely. Well, let me share some more information with you. And again, we're coming near to close because uh, what I do, Dr. Karen, is the last few minutes of the show, when we get near the end of the interview, I turn over the microphone to you in terms of promotion. And you can promote the book, any guest spe- speaking or book signings, any of that. you can say anything during that time with the exception of a dollar amount. Anything short of that, you are free to shout out anybody. You are free to, you know, again, let folks know where you're going to be, how to get in contact with you, your website, so forth and so on. So I'm going to share some more information with you. And then when we come back, we'll get closer to our wrap up. But I have had a thoroughly good time talking with Dr. Karen Anderson April this morning and hopefully you and the listening audience have learned something as well. She'll talk a little bit more about the book. I highly encourage you to get it particularly if you are single but not only if you're single if you're married as well because I have a feeling there's some tips in there that applies whether you're single or married in terms from a psychological perspective. So I'm going to share this information with you and then when we come back I'm going to turn the mics over to Dr. April, and she will let you know how you can get in touch with her, come do some speaking, or how, whatever you need her to do. I'm sure she can let you know how you'll be able to get her to do it. Hey, parents of children with asthma, here's another hit from the Breathe Easies. Don't smoke in the house. Don't smoke in the house. Don't smoke around the kids in the house. Don't smoke in the car. Don't smoke in the house. Don't break my heart. Preventing asthma attacks can be as simple as making your home and car smoke-free zones. For more Breathe Easy tips to help stop asthma attacks, go to noattacks.org. Brought to you by the EPA and the Ad Council. If you own a gun, you have a full-time responsibility. When you aren't using it, be sure it can't get into the hands of curious children, troubled teenagers, a thief, or anyone else who might misuse it. Your family, friends, and neighbors are all counting on you. Remember, always lock it up. For more information on firearm storage safety, visit ncpc.org. This message brought to you by the National Crime Prevention Council, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, and the Ad Council. The Reading Circle on WP 88.7 FM. All right, this has been an extended version of The Reading Circle, and that's okay. As I said, I have the flexibility in these three hours and I am so grateful and thankful for that I don't know what to do I am not really bound to stay within the format because the three hours are mine because as you know generally we move from the reading circle into the Eminem hour which is gospel music and then on into Martha and Friends which is also gospel music but I have the flexibility to extend the reading circle or to extend any one of the other two hours and we do that we've been doing more of that lately because the conversations have been that good so I always make my guests aware that you know the show is slated for an hour but it could run over when the conversation gets hot like it did this morning <laughs> and and it did and it's again my hope that you've actually learned something while having a couple of laughs and certainly 
something to think about. The book is Single is the New Black. Don't wear white till it's right. And the author is Dr. Karen Anderson Abril. And she's been on the line with me since six o'clock this morning. And as I said prior to the PSA, this is your chance to promote. Let everyone know again if you want to do a synopsis, if you want to do you know your websites, anything you want to share at this point, I'm going to turn the mic off again and you can have at it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mark. First of all, thanks for having me. This has been oh my gosh. I mean, I just every once in a while you have that interview with someone who you just obviously we've never met face to face, but we just connected. I mean, Absolutely. I just feel like your energy is so positive and so affirming and I just love what you're about and especially even hearing your background in education and musicianship and all that so this is just a treat so thank you so much uh, as far as getting in touch with me I'm at drkaren.me and Karen is with an I so d-r-k-a-r-i-n dot me and right now I am um, building my email list where I send out just a, a letter a, a small little newsletter like twice a month just letting people know what I'm about what I've been up to and I'll post things like this interview um, if I'm able to put it on a podcast or that sort of thing. By all means, so, I'll be um, sending it to you. Oh, that'd be great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes. So I'd like to, because in case people haven't been able to catch it live, they want to hear it at, 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 during their own time at their own convenience. Then Absolutely. we're able to do that. So that's a wonderful thing. So yeah, drkaren.me, again, Karen with an I. I'm on Twitter at Dr. Karen Anderson. I'm on uh, Instagram at Dr. Karen, again, D-R dot K-A-R-I-N. I'm, I'm just starting my Snapchat. <laughs> um, I'm on Dr. Uh, Facebook at Dr. Karen Anderson Abril. And, yeah, and this summer, like I said, I'm building my email list. I'm, I'm running a little um, – if you sign up for my email list, you'll be entered into a raffle just to win a BA gift card to treat yourself because singles, we got to treat ourselves um, because sometimes we need to take care of our own needs and – and uh, when we don't have that partner. But, um, again, my book is its everything we talked about today. It's, we go into a little bit more depth, and it's its a book that I wish had been available to me when I was single all those years. I dated for 27 years, from 15 until I got married to the love of my life at 42. And it's the book that I really wish had been available to me in those moments when I started falling prey to those, those, those the single shaming messages I was hearing and not believing in myself at, at times, you know, having those moments of self-doubt, like maybe I am too picky, but this book will give you a shot in the arm. It will help you uh, reaffirm what you know to be true, that you are living your authentic life and you are on your path and it doesn't matter what anyone else has to say about it and that you will only wait, uh, you're going to wait only for the most extraordinary of relationships and so, I, yeah, so I just encourage any singles to grab it. But like you said, I mean, I've had folks read it who are married and say, you know what? I, it's like, like Mark was saying earlier, I had that same pressure. Once I had the baby, then someone wants to know when I'm having another baby. And then I didn't have a girl, so when are you going to have the girl? And so we all can use this word to remind ourselves to stay true to ourselves. As cliche as it sounds, it is actually very powerful and empowering. Well, again, I thank you so much for rising because, again, Karen is on Central Time, so it's 622 there. And if she, now some people are, are early risers. They're like, well, this is no big deal for me because I'm, I'm up at 4 or 5 in the morning anyway. Other people are like, wow, yeah, this is a stretch. So I don't know which category you fall in, but I am grateful and thankful. And I agree with you in terms of feeling the energy. It's interesting. In most cases, every now and again, if an author comes to the New York area, they will let me know. And we actually will go off for lunch or dinner or something just to meet face to face. But most cases, that's, that's kind of like an outlier. But in most cases, we are on the telephone or Skype or what have you. But I agree with you. In terms of the energy, like I can feel it over the airways, and it does feel like we've known each other forever. I mean, and you, you just you just get that from the conversation and how we interact with each other, and it really does occur in a lot of cases. Some cases it, it doesn't. Some cases, like my guests, really make me work. Like, okay, hello, this is radio, not TV. We need we need talking. <laughs> You can't give me yes, no answers. <laughs> and then there are other times where it just clicks kind of like it did this morning. And for those of you who are listening who are single, it's okay. I mean, do not fall prey to that trap of everybody coming at you talking about why are you still single or when are you going to get that guy or when are you going to get that gal. If you're single and you like being single, stay single. You don't have to be married. Don't fall into that you have to be married trap. Now, I'm not down in my I, I'm a fan of marriage. So much of a fan that I've done it twice. And so I am a fan and advocate of marriage. But at the same time, 
you don't want to fall into that situation of feeling lonely within the marriage or getting into something mm-hmm. that you know, as you heard Dr. Karen say, this just didn't feel right from the beginning. <laughs> mm-hmm. And you still right. went down that road anyway. <laughs> you you don't want to go there. So I advise you to get the book. Is it downloadable? I see it's on Amazon. Is it in Kindle form as well? It is, yes. Okay, good. So it's it's in it's in electronic form. It's in paperback, hard copy form. However, but the book is single is the new black. Don't wear white. Now, see, this is easy to remember now because she got a nice little jingle there. Don't wear white till it's right. All right. Well, Dr. Karen Anderson Abril, I thank you again. I had a blast. I really will. And this show is recorded. I will be sending you two links. One is an MP3 link, and the other, I post my archives on a YouTube link. So you'll get the YouTube link as well as you'll get the MP3 link, and you can do whatever you'd like with it. Oh, thank you so much. This has just been a true pleasure. And I'm not a morning person, but you got me up and you got me going. So (laughs) I had a ball. I had an absolute ball. Good. Tell Daphne I said thank you. I talked to her yesterday. I I think she was doing an event. She was right in the middle of an event. And I said, okay, I I just wanted to make sure we knew it about tomorrow. And she's nowhere good. So I emailed everything and everything works. So tell Daphne I said thank you. I sure will. All right. Have a great day to you and yours. And we'll be in touch. Okay, thanks so much, Mark. All right, take care now. You as well. Bye-bye.